Turn with me in your Bibles to Psalms chapter 3. Psalm chapter 3, it should be behind me as well if you don't have your Bible, but over the course of the next several weeks, we are picking certain psalms or songs or prayers from these psalms and just meditating on them. This is going to be completely different from our normal series that we do where we normally dive into the text and it's deep, there's a lot of stuff in it. A lot of this over the next several weeks are going to be devotional. They're just meditations to remind us of who God is, of how great God is, and what God is doing in our lives. And so um, we've picked some of the psalms that we have loved, some of the psalms that we have grown up on. Some of these psalms that we're going to be looking at over the next several weeks are psalms that you guys have memorized, songs, songs that you guys have known, psalms like Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd. We'll be looking at that over the next couple of weeks. Other psalms, other psalms are ones that are not so familiar, but there's some great things in there that... Um, love for us to meditate on. And then there's some psalms that we're going to be looking at that you might think you're not familiar with them, but when you hear the words, you realize that you have sung these words in contemporary songs, but you didn't realize that they were actual words from the book of Psalms. So while we think that our modern songwriters have incredible gifts and powerful lyrics, the reality is many of them are just plagiarizing and taking words from David and the other psalmists and rewriting them into modern language and singing great theological truths that were already there in Scripture. The psalm that we're looking at this morning, the third psalm, is one of those psalms. For many of you, this isn't one of those psalms that sticks out as a favorite, but when you read the words of this prayer of David, you realize that these words have been sung in numerous songs throughout the history of the church. Contemporary worship, gospel worship, Messianic Jewish worship, these words have been sung in numerous different ways, and there's a reason for that. Not only does the words remind us of who God is, but the context of this psalm and where it was written reminds us that who God is doesn't change depending on the circumstances that we are going through in life. The same God that was our shield, our glory, and the lifter of our heads when life was good is the same God when things are going rough and life is throwing the worst that it could throw at us. The same God that was there when everything was blessed is the same God that's with us when things are rough. And David, while penning the words to this prayer to God in this psalm, teaches us this morning that we can pray with confidence that things will get better when things feel like they can't get any worse. David writes these words when life comes crashing upon him. Everything is going wrong in his life. His son, Amnon, decides that he loves his half-sister, Tamar, and she, he rapes his half-sister. He rapes her. His other son, Absalom, gets angry and decides that he's going to kill Amnon. David's family becomes a dysfunctional family overnight, and his life is falling apart. He's already committed adultery, already murdered someone so that he could keep his sin a secret, and now his family life is falling apart. Once Absalom kills his half-brother Amnon, he decides that he's now going to turn on David, his father, and creates an insurrection and tries to overthrow David from the throne. And because he was beautiful, because he was charismatic, because he was cunning, many people rejected David and began to join the revolt against the king. It became so bad that David had to flee Jerusalem. He had to leave the palace, and he had to run for his life. And it was during this time that David begins to pen the words of Psalm chapter 3. And when you read the first two verses of this psalm, it sounds like David was singing the blues. It has a melancholy feel, sad feel to it. The one who is able to lead the nation, the world, to a time of international peace was now on the run from his own people in a revolt that was being led by his own son. The man who has a heart after God was in a place in his life where it seemed that God has turned his back on him. So David begins his prayer by complaining. He begins by complaining and listing out everything that's going on and everything that's wrong. And listen, if we were in the same boat, so would we. When life begins crashing in, None of us would sit there and say, oh, it's great, it's perfect. We would begin to list our complaints. But the question is, who do we complain to? Who do we raise our concerns to? 
Oftentimes what me and you do is we go to one another and talk about how life is bad, how things are miserable, how God has turned his back on us. And we talk to one another as if one, the other person can help us. But the reality is there's only one person that can come to our aid and rescue when life begins to tumble apart. And David doesn't bring his complaints to other people because other people will never bring a solution to his life. David goes directly to the one that had the power to change his circumstances and lays it all out on the table before God. He's going through a really bad situation and the crisis was growing day in and day out and it doesn't look like tomorrow is going to get any better. So he prays and he tells God that is what his enemies were doing, what his enemies were saying, and he says, God, this sucks. That's what David says. Here's the first verse of Psalms chapter 3. He says, Oh Lord, how many are my foes? It was already a bad situation when his en- family turns on him, when his son be- leads the revolts against him. But now many of many people that used to be David's friends, his allies, his leaders, have now abandoned David and joined his son. People that David loved, people that David had done so much for, people that David had trusted, people that David had invested so much into, developed them into leaders of the nation, and now they're in high-ranking positions, and now they turn their backs on David. Everywhere he looks, friends have become foes. He doesn't know who he could trust, and he doesn't know who is going to backstab him. The foundation that kept his life in place all of these years are now cracking And everything is a mess. Listen, the reality is that this happens to all of us at some point in our lives, doesn't it? There are moments in our lives when things get bad. And if it wasn't just bad, it just gets one from one bad news to the next bad news. Like the old saying goes, when it rains, it pours. All of us at some stage in our life will go through a period of our life when It just feels like it can't get any worse, but all it does is keep getting worse. And listen, if you haven't been there yet, you haven't lived long enough because all of us will go through those kind of stages in our lives. Sometimes it is circumstances of life that cause the downpour. Other times it's people that we know, that we trust, that we love, that work hard to hurt us. Notice David doesn't say that there are many foes already, but he continues and says, not only are there many foes, but many are also rising up against me. This is a language, this is a military language. David was already outnumbered by his enemies. He was already facing an uphill battle. Every, his army has abandoned him. Everyone has abandoned him. The odds were growing against him day by day. More and more people were switching their loyalties each day. David begins his complaint to God by telling him, listen, God, all of these people are turning against me. And every morning I wake up, there's more people that have abandoned me. People that were with me yesterday are now on the other side. This is getting worse. But he doesn't end his complaint there. He doesn't just complain about what the enemies were doing. Oftentimes what people do to you hurt you. But sometimes what people say to you, say about you, wounds you even deeper. Sometimes it's words that the people are saying that hurt a lot more than the things that people do. In verse 2, David brings his second complaint to God. He says, listen, many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. Listen, in my life, I've seen people go through things that are so bad that only God could help them, right? But I've never seen someone go through something so bad that not even God could help them. I've never seen that. But the people are using these words, they're saying, there's no salvation for him. Basically, they're saying that God, who is able and willing and powerful enough to rescue and deliver, That God is not going to do it for David. That God has abandoned David. But they are saying that David's life is so bad that even God has rejected him. These words eventually reach the ears of David. Listen, it's one thing to hear that. But you know this. If you hear something negative over and over, it affects you. 
It changes you. It, it messes with you. Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher, said, it's the most bitter of all afflictions to be led to fear that there is no help for us in God. David's circumstances, what he was going through, led the people to conclude that God had turned his back on David. And listen, there's a logical conclusion for that. The people weren't wrong in assuming that. I heard said this earlier, David committed adultery. He murdered. All of those things were sinful, and God judged him, punished him for that. God told him his family would rise up against him. David repented. He asked God forgiveness, and God forgave him. But David still had to deal with the consequences of his sin. Listen, there's a warning here for those of us who are living in sin, thinking that God will just forgive us because God loves to forgive. That's true. But listen, there are consequences for our sins. There are consequences for the things that we do. God will forgive your sins, but he might not remove the consequences out of your life. A little boy was constantly rebelling and disobeying his parents. And in order to teach him a lesson, his father decided that he was going to drive a nail into the door of his room every time the child disobeyed. After seeing the nails pile up, the son finally repented of his rebellious ways. And in order to demonstrate his forgiveness, the father went in and removed all of the nails from the door. Minutes later, the boy came back into his father's room with tears in his eyes, and the father asked what was wrong. And the boy responded, the nails are gone, but the holes still remain. Listen, that's what sin is like. You may think you're getting away with it. You may think God will forgive you, but there are consequences for your actions. And we need to be mindful of that. This prayer of David reminds us that the scars of our sin will remain even after the wounds have healed. But listen, it also gives us another warning, though. And this is a warning not for those of us who are living in sin, but those of us who are quick to judge those who we feel that God is judging in sin. And here's a warning for us. There are many of us who are guilty of committing spiritual malpractice by incorrectly diagnosing why other people are going through the afflictions in their lives. We are quick to say it's because they've turned on God or God rejected them or whatever, and we're quick to judge other people and say this is why God is punishing them. We need to be mindful of that. Because David, in the midst of what he was going through, God never abandoned him. God never forsook him. It is not your job, it is not my job to play the role of God and act like you know why people are going through what they go through in life. You're not God. Don't act like it. Don't play it. I remember sitting at a funeral years ago of a friend. And after the funeral, families were sitting around and talking, and in the midst of the conversation, someone made the comment, she passed away because her sister divorced her husband. I just looked at him and said, if that's the God you serve, I don't want that God because that's not the God of the Bible. We need to be very careful of acting like we know why God is doing what he's doing. He doesn't. We don't know. Sometimes you will go through hardships in life, not because of any sin in your life, but because those hardships are going to make you stronger so that God can use you in greater ways. Take Job, for example. Don't act like God. So much more to say there, but i got to move on. The first thing that David does in his prayer is he brings his complaints to God, both the complaints of what people were doing and the complaints of what people were saying. However, if you look at verse 3 on, his, his mood completely changes. He shifts from his problems and now begins to focus on the greatness of God. Listen, the only way to face and overcome the battles we face in life is when you gaze on God. When you look at your problems long enough, they will become so big it feels like you'll never be able to overcome it. But when you begin to turn your attention to God, you begin to see God in his true size, God in his great stature, and our problems begin to fall back into its appropriate size. And this is what David begins to do here. He says, God, here's all of my problems. They seem overwhelming right now, but when I look at you, when my eyes are on you, when I'm gazing at you, when I see how good you are, when I see how powerful you are, when I see how magnificent you are, my problems 
fall into proper perspective. And when he does, the tone of his prayer completely changes. He doesn't continue to complain. He doesn't respond to the schemes, the actions, and the verbal threats of his enemies by becoming an emotional train wreck. He actually reminds himself in prayer of who God is and what God has done. And when life is overwhelming in our lives, instead of looking at our problems and freaking out, David teaches us and reminds us that we should look at God and how great he is and how powerful he is and how he is the only one that's able to deliver and set us free. That's what David reminds us. The people thought that God had abandoned David. They thought that there was no help for him anywhere. But David responds in a defiant tone in verse 3. While they were saying there's no salvation for him, David declares, but you, O God, verse 3, are a shield for me. You, my glory, the lifter of my head. Look at that verse again. You, O God, you are a shield about me. My glory, the lifter of my head. Notice David doesn't just make some random theological statement about God. It's personal to him. You are my shield. You are my glory. You're the lifter of my head. It's incredibly personal. This isn't the words of one who's been abandoned by God. These are the words of one who has a personal relationship with God and knows what God is like. And these are three powerful images that David uses. You're my shield. Back in Genesis, God spoke to Abraham after he defeats Sodom and Gomorrah, the people that overtook him. And God said to Abraham, I am your shield. And because I'm your shield, your reward shall be great. See, this is the confidence of a person who's entrusted their lives into the hands of God. The psalmist in the 84th Psalm says, God is a sun and shield. He bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from him who walks upright. God is our shield. He's a shield to those who put their trust in him. All of us have an idea what a shield looks like. We watch the, the movies, Captain America. They all have their shields. A shield is used to protect someone from arrows or swords or spears that the enemy is directing toward them. He would, use, he would fight with the other hand, but his one hand, he has his shield to protect him. The shield is a great protection if the only place that your enemy is coming from you is from directly in front of you. Notice what David says. You're a shield about me. You're about me. So when I'm facing forward, I don't have to worry about the enemy sneaking attack behind me because you're a shield about me. No matter which way I turn, I can walk in confidence because I know I'm protected. I can go forward, I can go backward, I can go to the left, I can go right, I can go any different direction. I'm okay because I know that you are a shield about me. Listen, we have a sovereign, complete, unfailing protection of God when we are faced with whatever the enemy has to offer us. The second thing that David declares is, God, you are my glory. This is an incredible statement by David, if you think about it, especially when you consider the circumstances that he's facing. As a king, David was crowned in glory, but at this moment, that crown was taken from him. He was an outcast. He was trying to fit in with normal people so that he wouldn't be identified. He was rejected. He's sneaking around in the forest so that his identity would not be discovered. And in the midst of that, David declares, God, you are my glory. What's he saying? He's saying my identity isn't found in what I do. My identity isn't found in who I am. My identity isn't found in my palace or my riches or my kingdom. My identity is found in the fact that I belong to you. (coughs) He's banished from his throne. He's exiled from his city. He's rejected by his family. Yet he declares that his identity and honor wasn't found in his throne. It wasn't found in the fact that he was king of the greatest city. It wasn't found that he had people under him. It wasn't found in his armies. It wasn't found in his riches or his friends or his family. It was found in the fact that he belonged to God. That's where he found his identity. Listen, for most of us, our identity is found in what we own or what we do or who we know. And if any of that is taken away, our life begins to fall apart. But because of Jesus, we don't need to base our identity on possessions. We have been declared sons 
and daughters of God. That's where our identity is. I'm somebody because I belong to God. God is my glory. You belong to him. That's where your identity is. The second, the third thing he says is the Lord is the lifter of my head. When you read the account of David fleeing Absalom in 2 Samuel, it says that David flew, fl flew away to the Mount of Olives weeping barefoot and had his head covered. The grief, the pain, and the shame that caused David to cover his head in shame. There was nothing he could do to lift his head in victory. But here he is declaring that, God, you are the lifter of my head. See, back in those days, the king not only served as the ruler of the land, but he also served as the judge of the land. And when someone would come before him with a case, the person would kneel before the king, waiting for the king to make his judgment. If the king found the person guilty, he would take his feet and put it on the person's neck. That declared that the person was condemned. However, if the person was found innocent, what the king would do was he would get up off of his throne, stoop down, and lift that person's head. Here's what David's saying. I have laid my case before God. I have told God everything that's been going on. And God, at the end, will stoop down and lift my head because I know that God is my lifter of my head. He's the lifter of my head. And you've got to ask the question, why does David have such great confidence in God? How can David declare in the midst of his circumstances that God is his shield, his glory, and the lifter of his head when life doesn't look that way at all? How can David say that when everything is going wrong, when it looks like God abandoned him, his family abandoned him, and his friends abandoned him? How can David be so confident? See, for David, these weren't just some theological truths that he learned in Sunday school. But David's life was a reminder of God's faithfulness in his life over and over and over. All David had to do was look at his past and say, God, you were faithful to me back then. I know you'll be faithful to me today. And I know if you're faithful to me today, you'll be faithful to me tomorrow. That's all David needed to remind himself. God, you are never changing. You're always there. In verse 4, David reminds himself how God answered his prayer in the past. Verse 4. I cried out to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. This is a powerful testimony of God's gracious answer to a believing prayer. David prays to the Lord. Notice how he prays. He cries out to God. There's a time for contemplative, quiet time, prayer time, but there's also a time where we go and passionately seek the face of God. God answers prayer. Psalms 34 says the poor man cried out to God, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. Paul Spurgeon again said, you don't need to fear a world when you can rejoice in a prayer answering God. Notice also where David says God heard his prayer from, from the hill, from the holy hill. This is the place of God's sanctuary, the place where the presence of God dwelt among his people. David the king had been banished from his throne. But David knew his enemies could never banish God from his throne. God was still on the throne, watching over the affairs of humanity, even when the man in charge on that planet was on the run. Not only does God answer prayers, but David was confident in God because it was God who sustains him. I mentioned earlier that Psalms 3 and Psalms 4, they were written at the same time in the same context. Both of them were written together. In Psalm 4, David says that he can go to sleep in peace because God alone will allow him to dwell in safety. That's a good reminder that when we sleep, that God is watching over us. We can sleep in peace because God is the one that keeps us safe. Not a gun, not an alarm system, not our dogs, not anything else. It is God who keeps us safe. But in this third psalm, in the fifth verse, David states the fact that he's able to wake up in the morning. In verse 5, he says, I lay down and I slept. I woke up again for God sustained me. Think about this. He is on the run. Enemies are chasing him. No, he doesn't have safety at all. You would think David would be pacing the floor all night. 
But here he is able to lay down. And he doesn't just lay down with one eye open the whole night, watching to see if his enemies were advancing. He lays down and has a good sleep, and he wakes up in the morning. Think about it. In this position, he is the most vulnerable person in the world. But he lays down. He sleeps. And he declares in the morning that he woke up. Why? Because God sustained him. Listen, that's our testimony as well. This morning, the only reason you are sitting here is because when you went to bed last night, the hand of God was on your life and he allowed you to see this day. It is not because of your health. It's not because you worked out 50 times a week. It's not because you eat healthy. It is God in his grace and mercy that allowed you to see this new day in your life. God heard his prayer. God sustained him through the night, but God also relieved him from his fears. Verse 6, I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves around me. Remember back in verse 1, he talked about many enemies. Now he makes it more concrete. He says there's thousands of them. But he says he's not afraid. And there are plenty of reasons to be afraid. There's more on the other side than there are with him. But because he knew who God was, and because he knew what God did for him, David made a determination in his life that he was not going to allow fear to dictate how he lived his life. Someone once said that courage is just fear that said its prayers. The Bible calls it faith. Trust in God relieves our fears. It doesn't matter what we're going through. It doesn't matter what the doctors say. If God is on our side, you're in the majority. The psalmist wrote, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is a stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? This psalm is a prayer of David. But unlike us, where we come and we tell God everything we need right away, David doesn't actually make a request of God till verse 7. Up to verse 7, he either complains about God, complains to God, or tells, reminds himself of who God is. But in verse 7, he finally makes a request to God. He brings his complaint. He places his confidence and trust. Now he's giving the battle to God, who is willing, ready, and more than able to fight the battle for him. Look at verse 7. Verse 7, David declares, Arise, O Lord. This is actually a war cry in which David is calling God to act on his behalf. This isn't the first time we see a request like this in the Bible. Back when the people of Israel were in the wilderness wandering around, every time they stepped forward, Moses would declare, Arise, O God, and let your enemies be scattered. And God would constantly fight their battles for them. They would stand in front of a wall, walk around it seven times, and it would collapse. They would... They would fight and they would go into battlegrounds and see their enemies already destroyed. They would walk toward a sea and the sea would part in front of them. God, Joshua would speak and the sun would stay up all night because God was fighting the battle for them. God constantly fought their battles for them. And when the people were saying that God had abandoned David, David went to God himself and says, Save me, my God. On the basis of his personal relationship, he prayed God would save him, help him, rescue him, deliver him, liberate him, and re restore him. David could make such a bold request based on two realities. Here's what he says. For you strike my enemies on the cheek, you break the teeth of the wicked. Those are harsh words. Unchristian-like words, right? Um, but those are what David says. David says, I'm not going to take the matter into my own hands. So he asked God, number one, to keep his enemies from hurting him. The idea there of striking the cheek is the idea of, God, would you put my enemies back in their place? Would you insult them? Would you remind them that you are for me? And the idea of breaking their teeth is the idea of these animals trying to devour them. He says, would you take away what they could use to hurt me? They are using their words to wound him and grieve him. David says, Knock their teeth out. Just give them one good punch. David uses dramatic language to make the point that God will fight the battles for us. If you say, when does God fight our battles for us? 
Give me an example. There's no greater example than the cross. When there was no way that we could overcome sin, when there was no way that we could live our lives the way God intended for us to live, God doesn't just leave us and say, well, you figure it out and fight your own battle. But he sends his own son. He sends him into the world to live the life that we should have lived. To die the death that we should have died. So that this morning we don't sit here as enemies of God. But we sit here as sons and daughters of God. God fights our battles. That's why Paul in Romans could write with such confidence. He says, what then shall we say of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will we not also, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who can bring a charge against God's people? It's God who justifies. Who can condemn Jesus Christ is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who was at the right hand of God, who is now interceding for us. The God who fought you, fought for you to get you access into heaven, is the same God that's fighting for you on your journey there. He didn't just save you and leave you, but he is daily fighting the battles for you. You have a God who never leaves you or abandons you. Look at the last verse. We're almost done. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. David's enemy were saying there's no salvation for David. But they didn't have the last word at all. Salvation never comes from any man. It belongs to God. Only God can save. David closes the psalm by saying, your blessing be upon your people. And he's saying that this testimony is more than just about David. This is a testimony of all who Trust in God. This is a testimony from you. It's a testimony from me. That God fights our battles. What God did for David, he can do for you. God will give you the victory. He is faithful to his people. That's why in the epistles, they write, even when we are unfaithful, God remains faithful. Back during the Great Depression, There was a man by the name of Mr. Yates who lived here in Texas, and he owned a farm here. The depression really affected his life, and he was having trouble keeping up with his monthly mortgage payments. The bank eventually came to him and said he had 30 days to catch up on all of his payments, or they would come and foreclose on his farm. With just a few weeks remaining before the bank would foreclose, a man came to Mr. Yates' door. He worked for an oil company, and he asked him to give, this, give the company permission to drill on his farm for oil. Mr. Yates, realizing that he didn't have much time anyway, signed the lease and gave the company permission to drill. And they began to drill. And they hit a gusher. 80,000 barrels of oil in one day. And they found many subsequent wells that were even twice as large. Mr. Yates owned it all. Overnight, this man who was just weeks away from losing everything became a multimillionaire. He was able to pay off all of his outstanding debt and live the rest of his life in luxury. Let me ask you a question. When did Mr. Yates become a multimillionaire? Was it the day that he signed the lease for the oil company to drill? Was it the day that they first discovered the oil in his farm? Was it even the day that they first sent him a check, his first check? Was that when he became a multimillionaire? May I suggest to you that it wasn't? Mr. Yates was a multimillionaire the moment he had bought the farm. The day he purchased the land, he already owned all of the minerals, all of the oil that was on his property. But he was living in poverty. He was just weeks away from losing his home. A multimillionaire that lived in poverty because he didn't realize what he owned. The problem, he didn't know what he had in his land. This morning, many of us are living in poverty and we're struggling because we haven't tapped into the resources of this great God that lives inside of us. 
He says, I am with you. I will never leave you. The moment you have put your trust in God, you are blessed. Regardless of what you're going through today, regardless of what life is thrown at you, regardless of what is happening in your life, you have the greatest treasure in the world inside of you. It's called Almighty God. The one who is able to speak the world into creation resides inside of you. And yet you live depressed, discouraged, defeated, because you haven't tapped into the resources that God has placed inside of you. Everything that you need for life, everything that you need to live this life has already been given to you. The Holy Spirit resides in you. Jesus is interceding for you. God is fighting for you. Listen, you are blessed regardless of what you're going through this morning. Just because life doesn't feel like it doesn't mean life has the final word. God will give you the victory. I spoke earlier that the greatest testimony of a God that fights for us is Jesus that was willing to die on the cross for our sins. When we didn't deserve it, when we had no way to prove ourselves to God, God came in and fought the battle for us. God won the victory for us. This moment here, in a few moments, we're going to come to the table. We're going to grab the elements from the table, and these elements remind us That the reason we're here this morning is not because of how good we are, not because we were so victorious or we were so powerful. The reason we're here this morning is because we have a God who is willing to fight the battle for us. A God who is willing to give his life so that we can be called sons and daughters of God. The table reminds us that God is working for us. So this morning, as you examine your heart, as you examine your life. Maybe this morning you're living in fear about what your future holds. This table reminds you he's with you. Maybe you're worried about what, what's going to happen. This table reminds you he's your provider. Maybe you're discouraged this morning. This table reminds you that if there's one person that will never fail you, it is Jesus. Maybe you feel alone. This table reminds you, he's there with you. Would you examine your heart? If there's anything that's unlike Jesus in you, and it doesn't have to be a blatant sin, maybe it's just you don't trust God enough in your life. Maybe you're living afraid, discouraged, worried. None of those are from Jesus. Maybe this morning you need to repent. Maybe this morning you come and you're angry. That's not from Jesus. Maybe it's because you're trying to fight your own battle and not trusting God to fight the battle for you. You need to repent. So I'm going to invite you to examine your hearts as the worship team plays in some music and sings. And when you are ready, I'm going to invite you to come and grab the elements from the table. Take the elements, grab them, come back to your seat. And as soon as the worship team is done, I'll come up and we'll partake of the table, the elements together. Examine your hearts. God is faithful to you. He'll never abandon you, never forsake you. You don't need to live a defeated life. He's with you. Let's worship.